three. Ah, uh, stop. Three, two, one. Hey, what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up, what's up? Hello to my entrepreneurs of all sorts, for profit and nonprofit, to my shakers and movers from all over the world. Thank you for tuning in to our podcast this morning, afternoon, and or evening. Whenever you may be downloading this podcast, we appreciate your support. I'm your host, Nathan Webster, for Social Entrepreneur with Nathan A. Webster. This podcast is brought to you by NW and Associates, where we love helping you, consulting you through your marketing and website needs. So give us a call at 360-448-7439 because we're in Vancouver, but we can work remotely. Contact us via nwebsterllc.com if you want to reach out to us that way as well. So today's podcast is special, obviously, because you see me on the video, right? But we also got a guest. We got Black Girl Power with Sean Trace. Can you say what's up to the listeners? Hey, everybody. I'm so glad y'all tuned in. And I'm excited about talking with you about what we have going on here. Awesome, awesome, awesome. I'm excited. I'm not going to steal your thunder. So just let's get into it because I know you got a lot to share. (laughs) So... Tell us, the listeners from all over the world, who you are, what you do. So my name is Shantrice Martin. I'm the executive director for the Bay Area Urban Debate League. We serve hundreds of students in San Francisco, Oakland, the greater Bay Area, and helping them prepare for college. Um, The best part of this organization is that it's run by Black women, which is kind of rare, but also one of the most amazing things that exists in our organization is that we hire our alumni. So people who graduate from this program then go on to have leadership roles. Um, Yeah, and we do a lot more than that, but we'll get into that a little bit as the conversation flows. Well, no, we got to keep it going. So as it flows into one... It's Urban League. Uh, a lot of people don't know what Urban League is, so I need you to tell the listeners what that is. And also, why is it ran by all black women? <laughs> uh, so the Bay Area Urban Debate League is one of 22 or so urban debate leagues across the country with a specific focus on recruiting black, Latino, marginalized, low-income um students with uh, poor grades, recruiting them into policy debate in order to facilitate greater change. So cultivating the next uh, W.B. Du Bois or the next Ella Baker, that's part of our goal in making sure that we take the resources we have in policy debate and redistribute them to communities that are usually excluded. Um, For myself, I debated for the University of Louisville back um, 10 years ago, a little more than 10 years ago. I don't want to show my age. Um, And one thing it did for me first was give me a full scholarship Uh, The second is I got to go out of the country. I went to the University of the West Indies in Trinidad. I went to Belize. I got to teach in the Dominican Republic. All these things happened because I was involved in policy debate. At the time, the entire debate community across the country was 0.7% Black. And my debate team was 90% of that 0.7%. Not 7%, 0.7%. There was a study by Dr. Shelton K. Hill that... Kind of no, no, through. keep going because wow, this is like hold on. You said, <laughs> but there was a study mm-hmm. point. Like, are you saying like one percent basically, or are you were like zero point one percent, less than one percent? And this was back when I debated in college, and debate had already been around for decades, right? So Dr. Shelton K. Hill did a study about why there are so few Black people involved in policy debate. It's not like we're dumb, right? We're definitely intelligent. We produce scholars just like any other race. So what he looked at was the motivation of people who debate, right? So the Black people who debated had a certain style, like had a certain swag that other people didn't have, but that was punished, right? The point in debate was to be as robotic as possible, to be objective, to not talk about um, your community and your social location. So a lot of people stylistically who were Black were radically different than people who were traditionally debate, white, wealthy males. Um, So when my team, the University of Louisville, led by Daryl Birch and Dr. Warner and Tiffany Dillard Knox, when they came on the scene, it was like, it was a revolution in a sense, um, because there were people now who were people of color, but also talking about 
uh, people of color, specifically black people. So we took the policy aspect and we learned about NATO. We learned about all these different pieces of legislation. Um, and we took that and related it to our social location. When I started debating, a 19-year-old man named Michael Newby was shot in the back by the police. So for me, that hit hard because I was close to his age. Um, I knew some of the same people he knew. And we brought that issue of police brutality with into debate and talked about the fact that a prerequisite to any policy change is to first fix the inherent racism. Because if we create policies within a racist system, we're just exporting that exploitation. Um, so that's kind of the background. And from that and other organizations who recognize there are no black people, there are no Latino people, there are no people who speak English as a second language. Um, that started um, that started sort of a movement to get more urban, so-called urban students involved in policy debate to diversify it and to create a pipeline of success so that um, if someone debates in high school, then they have a pipeline to college debate or to becoming an attorney or a senator. Um, our program director is actually running for office right now. So we wanted to create something sustainable that allowed people to get access to the rewards and benefits of policy debate. Um, it, it's been an incredible journey, but the reason why I specifically work with the Bay Area Urban Debate League is because we hire at least 90% um, of our staff tends to be alumni from the program. So it's not just about helping them when they're in high school, but also moving towards getting them employment and beyond just working here, making sure that they have the skills necessary to succeed, uh, not only on the job market, but whatever they happen to do, whether it's college, starting their own business. Um, and that's, that's a really unique thing that Urban Debate Leagues offer that I'm very happy to be a part of. Um, wow. Yeah, so hold, hold, that's a hold. little bit. <laughs> that wasn't a little bit, girl. That was a <laughs> lot. Like, I'm like, man, I'm like, oh, shoot. I'm like, teach me, sister boy. Teach me. I'm like, where's my popcorn? Um, <laughs> so you, you said University of Louisville, you got a full right scholarship. Like, yo, I didn't even know that's even possible. But the, I mean, anything's possible, especially in with these competitions. But you're in the Bay Area? Like, how did you get way out here? So hold on. Like, you're, I mean, this is like, <laughs> wow, there's, you're missing, like, you know, fill in, fill in the details. Um, so I've actually been involved with the Bay Area Urban Debate League for 10 years. Um, so when I graduated from college, a lot of college students um, from the debate community are then hired as coaches for younger students or as consultants or as directors. Um, so my first summer out of college, I was offered a summer position to come and teach at one of the camps. Um, so that's where I started my involvement. And from there, I worked um, in the Washington Urban Debate League, New York Urban Debate League, Miami, Silicon Valley. Uh, so it's sort of a family and <clears throat> maybe a better way to describe it is a gang because you can't get out. <laughs> <laughs> Not in a bad way. Not in a bad way, but um, oh, okay. it's, it's a family that no matter where you go, you just have a network. Um, and so I went from working in D.C. with their Urban Debate League in the Washington Urban Debate League and working with the Baltimore Urban Debate League to transitioning to California about three years ago. Um, and I just have been amazed by the students. And that's really what drives the organization. Um, we have at our biggest capacity, I think we had about 450 or so students in the Bay Area, which is unheard of for a youth program especially when it's academic, because a lot of people, when they hear debate, it sounds boring. Like it's a harder sell than basketball or, you know, like any of these soccer camps. So for our students, I'm especially intrigued by the ones who will show up on Saturday at seven in the morning to debate until 7 p.m. And like, we'll go hard. And for our most advanced students, they will go to like a Stanford or Berkeley or Harvard debate tournament from 7 a.m. to midnight and do that for three days in a row. Right. So part of the reason I decided to stay out here in the Bay Area was because our students are especially gifted and they face so much like they have so much trauma. There are students who are involved in trafficking, which is really prevalent out here in Oakland. There are students who are the sole provider for their family, students who serve as a translator for their parents. Um, you know, so they have all these issues, but they still come in debate. They still volunteer their time. They still uh, come back after they graduate high school and work with us. Um, so for me, that is a unique thing. Although all the urban debate leagues, I feel like are good organizations. They're strong. They have uh 
aspects that are wonderful. The Bay Area Urban Debate League specifically focuses on uh, retention of our students, not just like come one time or come a few times and then we'll see you later. Um, it's about having a higher quality of education and a higher quality of relationships between our staff and the students. I think that's absolutely amazing. Our staff are some of the strongest that I've seen in any group, um, very dedicated, going above and beyond. And they really connect with the students. And I think that's something you can't really teach. It's not there's not a way to train that. Um, but our staff is particularly interested in making sure our students succeed. Is this maybe where you're talking about the black girl power as your specific resource, your superpower? Right. Because you is, is I mean, uh, I don't want to say you can identify with them because or, I don't know. And I don't know. I ain't trying to get up in your business and say, say all your business because Louisville is down south, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that, that ain't the same thing as going to Cali, you know. So, <laughs> like, how, how does, how, like, how do you guys, how, how, like, how are you so successful? So, a lot of it dates back to 10 or so years ago when the organization first started. The first group of students we had, um, were just phenomenal. There were students who were homeless or who went through all these issues. And there are also students who have like a perfect home and don't have any troubles and have money. But for the most part, our students are from backgrounds that would traditionally hinder them from academic success. Um, so our focus has always been on the students. Like, what do the students want to talk about? They get to vote on the topic. They uh, have a lot of decision-making power in our organization. And because the start of our organization, they were primarily black and brown uh, students of color, they were the ones who shaped the organization. So even to this day in hiring alum, that is an idea from the students themselves. They want to see people who look like them in positions of power and decision-making roles. Um, so having that as our core, having students as the center is what has allowed us to continue for 10 years. Um, and we've had ups and downs even before I got here. Um, but one thing I've seen that's been consistent over this decade of our existence is that it is focused on students, specifically on students who are traditionally marginalized. And that's something that a lot of organizations shy away from because it seems like it could be a liability, you know, or we just want someone who's professional, quote unquote, um, whereas we want someone who cares about the kids first and foremost. Like if you don't have the training or you know, you may have an associate instead of a bachelor's or you have only worked at Target or wherever else um, and not like an office. We don't care as much about that as we care about you focusing on our students because they are the most important part of this job. So, yeah. And, you know, of course, that means we're going to get black girl magic. Uh, I spoke about our program director earlier. I met her when she was in this program 10 years ago. Um, and our um, current program coordinator was also in this program, and they bring a particular area of expertise that cannot be taught. Um, they have been able to resolve conflicts in ways that uh, other people wouldn't even think of. Like if a student is about to fight, right, or if a student is just really sad, if a student can't make it to the tournament because they have to take their brother and sister to school. Like these are women who have been able to like find childcare for other people's children who have been able to uh, get access to scholarship that traditionally we're blocked off from uh, women who at the drop of a dime could tell you 10 different resources for a student who is about to be on probation. Right. So when they come out of incarceration, they have options so they don't go right back in. Um, and I, that's something that, exists because they are from the communities that we serve well so you know you you kind of just answered my question of how how are you changing the world when it comes to all, all i mean you're changing the world yet you forcing yourself to be in a very precarious situation because there's not a lot of uh black women running organizations especially in cali yeah. And, you know, honestly, coming from Kentucky, I had this false idea of Oakland and California that it was there will be a black owned business on every block and it would just be this uh, little mecca for black people. And to a certain extent, it is compared to Kentucky. Um, but one thing is that our sort of tribe cultivates each other's success. Um, and that's something I feel like is unique to black women run organizations. We lean on each other. Um, if there's an issue, it's not, there's not a fear of, I will be looked at as less than, 
if I bring this issue up. Um, and some things are second nature. Like we know racism is a thing. I don't have to sit in a board meeting and explain, here's what racism is. Here's why it is bad that you called her Shaniqua when her name is Keisha. Here's why you shouldn't do these certain things. We don't have to have those conversations. Um, it's more of a, a solidarity. So I, I say that having that burden lifted off your shoulder is part of the reason why we can do the things we do, um, because we don't have that extra step of having to prove that discrimination exists before getting to the solution. So we cut out that step and we're able to focus more broadly on what is going to put our students and us in a position to succeed. So here, I, I want to take a, a tangent, but come back a, rel- a related <laughs> A related question, what what can you tell for the, the white allies that are listening to you? How can then they support you in the work and the efforts that you're doing as a Black-led, Black woman-ran organization? How can they help you? And that maybe is, you know, white allies, both men and women, because I know that's the difference as well. <laughs> it definitely is. Um, So the first thing would be to... Listen to Black women and trust Black women. Um, There has been a tendency in some of the organizations I've been part of that there's always like not a second guessing because I think a healthy amount of skepticism is good, right? You have to do your due diligence. But there's been like a second, third, fourth, fifth guessing, even after uh, there's a Black woman who has been able to defend why she makes certain choices and that the results are the ones that you desired in the first place. So I think just trusting black women more, uh, trusting women of color in general, people of color in general, uh, for certain things that they don't necessarily have expertise on. Uh, For instance, when, uh, as she's known now, Barbecue Becky did what she did, there were some people who said, well, she just felt unsafe or she wasn't sure, or maybe, right? But there were Black people all over the country and all over the world, arguably, who said, no, this is wrong. This is racist. She did this because these are Black people, right? And there was still that voice of like, well, come on now. She's nice. She's a professor or she, you know, I think she had good intentions. That good intention thing is something Ella Baker talked about, right? Like good intentions don't necessarily mean that I don't get hurt. Like, oh, you didn't mean to call the police on me and get me arrested when I was innocent? Okay, it's fine. Right. So I think focusing on trusting black women, number one, but also then like getting other people to do the same. It's one thing if a white person says I'm actively going to try to uh, be anti-racist, but also calling out their colleagues and friends who do racist things or who habitually commit microaggressions. Right. So I think it's a two step process. One is acknowledging that you do the things and trying to stop them. Two is sort of exporting your level of consciousness now. And if you're in a meeting where someone says something racist or, or like calls a, a black coworker ghetto um, or anything like that, call it out. And it's going to suck for you because you're going to be that one person who always calls it out. But that's how we feel every day. So I think as as a white person or even a non-black person of color who is in a position of power to number one, hold yourself accountable. But number two, which may be more important, is to spread the word and hold other people accountable. The more you call it out, the more people recognize it. And that's not something we can do because white people don't necessarily feel comfortable in a room saying something racist when I'm there. Their guard is up. But when they're around other white people, things happen that if a black person was in the room would be seen as wrong. But absent our presence, we need someone to advocate. Um, and I think that that is a really good way to be an ally that doesn't step on our toes. And it isn't like a Jesus complex or a savior complex. It's more of like, I'm recognizing what I do. And when I see it in others, I'm going to call it out as well. Same thing for men who are sexist, right? There are some spaces like a locker room or a barbershop where there might not be women and sexist things happen. And it is the man who is in the room's job, if he wants to be an ally, to call those things out and try to actively create change. So I think it would be the same thing for an ally. Just have our back even when we're not there. I like that. Have your back. I, I like that. I like that. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I mean, you said her name. I don't know if she's your, your hero, but who, who would you consider a professional hero or mentor if you have the chance to be mentored by someone? Who would that person be? 
Uh, so I actually have two. Uh, my mentor, who's actually my mentor, is James Rowland. He's the executive director for the Atlanta Urban Debate League. Um, and he was the only black judge I had when I debated in college. So I kind of was clinging to him by default because <laughs> he was the only one who looked like me. But he's actually a phenomenal leader and he cares a lot about students and has given me excellent advice over the years. And then the other person who is not someone I can meet, but would have been Ella Baker. Um, she was, I mean, an amazing leader because she was so different than most leaders. Like she didn't clamor for the the fame or the recognition. She just did the work. And um, for me, her and Fannie Lou Hamer are kind of close, close in the way that they led. Um, but Ella Baker is definitely someone who, if I could have been mentored by her, like I think I would have been even better. Her the the legacy she left behind is one that I would like to leave behind. Um, the Ella Baker Freedom Schools are amazing. I volunteer with the Freedom Center, the Ella Baker Freedom Center here in Oakland, where we write letters to people who are incarcerated and try to get them resources. And it's just everything that is done in her name is a type of thing I want to do and be involved in. So yeah, if I could combine James Rowland and Ella Baker, that would just be the perfect mentor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, uh, fair enough. We'll, we'll say we'll say, we'll say two, we'll, uh, <laughs> not one of the same, but some of the same. <laughs> All right, so uh, a couple of questions to to end the or conclude the interview here. Uh, what would be a fun fact about you that maybe someone doesn't know? <laughs> um, I overshare on social media, so I don't know how many fun facts people don't know about me. Um. I think one fact that is not fun, but is really important for any leader, leader, especially a black woman in a traditionally non-black uh, led role, is that I, half the time I am terrified and, and have anxiety. Like it's not a fun fact, but it's important because I feel like we have that imposter syndrome, and we often feel like I'm I'm inferior, I'm doing everything wrong, and um, they're just waiting to replace me. Like I have that feeling every single week. At least once a month, I'm like, oh, I need to quit so they can actually get a good ED. Or, you know, so like, I feel like letting people know that about me um, is a relief because there are a lot of people who are far more qualified than myself, even though I'm very qualified, uh, who feel like they're not doing a good job, who feel like I'm messing up every single thing. And I mean, we probably are messing up a bunch of stuff, right? We're human, Um, especially a young ED, you're gonna mess up a whole bunch of times. But knowing that other people are also messing up and also have anxiety and fear and even depression uh, for some people, right? Knowing that I feel like is a fact that folks need to embrace because then it means when I have those feelings, I don't feel alone. Um, that's one thing my mentor has taught me and I've experienced in this job. You're gonna feel like you're trash, as the kids say. You're gonna feel like you're messing up, that everything that's bad is your fault, everything that's good belongs to someone else. But the reality is, you're probably doing an amazing job, regardless of the criticism. The thing about being an executive director is you mostly get the complaints. You're like Toby from the office and <laughs> it does not feel good most of the time. But the reality is most of us, especially black women in these leadership roles are doing an amazing job, are phenomenal. And that constant thing of like, oh my God, I'm failing, I'm doing bad, this went wrong. It's mostly in our heads. So I think the fun fact about me is that I actually do suffer from anxiety and I have battled with depression and just feeling like I'm not the one who deserves this spot. I'm holding this spot for someone else who is more qualified, right? So knowing that I experienced that, other Black women in these positions experienced that, and we are all wrong about that. I think that is what I would like people to know. Got it. Well, I think time times up i think that's uh that should be <laughs> something you say as well because that that self-deprecating is over now no more saying that <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, i'm gonna work <laughs> you work on it all right <laughs> all right so then uh what about the other side what's your worst habit um, I think my worst habit is not wanting to delegate things. Um, cause sometimes I have this fear that like, if I don't do it, it's not going to be done right. And that is not true either. Um, part of the reason teams are amazing is because you have different people who can put in on the problem, right? Um, 
it's always better to have multiple people from multiple perspectives, which is why diversity and inclusion matter so much, because you get better results. Um, and if you're working on it by yourself, you're celebrating by yourself, which means you're not really celebrating most of the time. And I think having not only a to-do list that you check off and accomplish, that's important, but also celebrating the milestones, which small nonprofits like us, sometimes you're just working, working, working work and getting stuff done. You don't take the time to celebrate. Um, so my worst habit is not delegating slash running through everything so fast that I don't celebrate our success. And I know I just hit you with two again, even though you asked me for one. <laughs> I hope that's okay. <laughs> All right. I, I mean, I, I guess I have to take it then, right? <laughs> kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, the last question I would have for you, Chantrice, what advice can you give the listener uh, that's maybe running a small nonprofit or a larger nonprofit, but what maybe for a person of color, just what, what advice have you received throughout the years or as an ED that has really worked well for you that you want to pass on to the fellow listeners out there? Mm, I, I mean, I've been blessed to have a lot of people in my corner, mentors, colleagues, um, So it's kind of a difficult question. Just one piece of advice. If nothing else, I would say consider yourself. Um, When we work in nonprofits, it's usually because we're passionate about whatever the cause is, whether it be people, animals, poverty. um, And we can kind of get um, caught up in that where we're drowning. And this is emotional labor, um, quite honestly. No matter how far removed you are from the clients or the students, you still feel what they go through. Um, and especially when students start to trust you and confide in you, it can be a lot to take on. Um, so I think considering yourself, whether that's you meditate, for me, I box, um, people might hike or go running or just like go to a basketball game. But I would suggest to consider yourself because oftentimes, especially with black women, we put everyone else's needs ahead of ours. And then we end up with hypertension and all these issues related to health and, you know, mental health issues that we never take the time to work out. So um, consider yourself and know that that's okay. Like sometimes you just got to take time and recharge. And that's not only okay, that's a healthy, mature adult thing to do. Well, not everybody can wear unicorn shirts, (laughs) Shantri. true i happen to have a great thrift store by my house that's where i get (laughs) i I think um you know i I was thinking about uh you know with that unicorn is you know that's the valuation when you're the billion dollar unicorn um but that you know that's the number one the number one problem that we don't do is we give so much away of of ourselves that we don't come back and take care of ourselves you know which is at the end of the day, we got to take care of ourselves. Yep. It's, somebody told me this once, and I never thought about it uh, until recently. But, you know, when they tell you put your mask on first, as a mom, I'm like, no, I'm going to put my child's mask on, right? It, like, that's my instinct. But, you know, if you didn't passed out, you can't help anybody else. So I think that that notion of, like, put your mask on first, that way you can help more people. And that's something we we tend not to do as black women. And I think we should do more. Um, we're always filling up other people's cup. And when ours is empty, we're just out here thirsty and dehydrated. So filling our own cup up first. Um, you know, there are times when you should be selfless, but there are times when you should focus on yourself. And I just hope that more of us consider ourselves when making decisions, whether career or personal. All right. And for the listeners, I want to find more about where you overshare or where they can get all this information (laughs) from. What what social media handles can you give them? Uh, So the first one is Facebook because I'm always on there. And you can at me, Shantree Smartin, S-H-A-U-N-T-R-I-C-E-M-A-R-T-I-N. And you can find our organization at Bay Debate, B-A-Y-D-E-B-A-T-E. Um, and on social media, on Twitter, you can find us at B-A-U-D-L. So we try to keep it simple for y'all. <laughs> that was really simple. Sorry, I was like, oh. Uh, <laughs> I was like, I got to write some of this stuff down. <laughs> Woo. All right. And... Uh, 
In no no IG, no YouTube, no, none of that stuff? No, we keep it simple around these parts. Um, you know, people get caught up on IG and YouTube, so we try to stay off of those. <laughs> that snap. You better stay off of snap. <laughs> oh, I don't even have that app. I don't even know how it operates. I just know kids get in trouble for it. So, yeah, I'm a, I'm gonna stay in my lane with the Facebook and Twitter. I can keep that together. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chantrice, I want to say thank you so much for joining us today, and I can't wait for my listeners to get a chance to peep you out uh, on on um, what what do these youngins say? Uh, I don't know what they say. Uh, you'll know better than me. I done already said my two little phrases that I know from the <laughs> Oh, wait a minute. No, I got another one. It's lit. It's lit. That's a good thing, I think. So. Yeah, that is a good thing. <laughs> all right, y'all. Well, I'm going to call it a wrap. I want to say thank you again for all of our listeners worldwide tuning into Social Entrepreneur with Nathan A. Webster, where I wish you much success in all your endeavors. Dream big and Godspeed. I'm out. Bye, Chantrice. Bye.